Okay. Sarah Freedom. Uh, the next comment here. Sincere question, Husky. God makes no errors, mistakes. I agree with that. Women cannot preach, teach according to you and KJV. Well, no, it's not according to me. It's according to the King James Bible. Let me show you that very quickly just to get that thing cleared up. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Okay, you say, well, that's just to the, to the Corinthians. No, because if you go over to, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is writing to a young pastor. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says, uh, verse 11, Let the women... Woman, learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being in, deceived was in the transgression. Then chapter 3 says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So it's very clear that church leadership is supposed to be male. Well, then women have to just be these meek, quiet, little abused, you know, creatures that just get kicked around. No, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. Aquila and Priscilla were quite a team in ministry. And uh, I do believe that she would have been there, you know, when they corrected Apollos and things. I think that she was probably there offering some suggestions as well. It's talking about government, you know, governing within the church, the oversight of the flock. All right, and I don't mean secular government. I mean within matters of church-related things. Um, it's what the Bible teaches. Okay, so it's not you, you know, meaning me, according to you. No. If this is correct, and I assume it is after listening to you, then what about the common incidence of the birth of the hermaphrodite? Well, I don't think it's a common incidence. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. Can this person preach, teach, or no? Both genitals are present, so the person is multi-gendered. The answer cannot be that it would depend on what sex they were raised as because that, that would have been up to the parents and therefore could be an error. This condition is not rare, and this question is sincere. I look forward to the answer or opinion you have and would love to hear what scripture you based the decision on. Well, I have to go with what the Bible teaches, and, and I want you to understand that. Um, let me just type something in here as I'm thinking about it because if I'm yapping a lot, um, I'm going to end up forgetting what I was going to say. Uh, whatever I teach and, and preach has to be bound to this book. Okay, um, The way you form a cult is to get rid of final authority. See, I can tell anybody out there that you can judge me if you find I'm wrong according to this book. But now if I wanted to have a cult, I would have to get rid of something like that where other, where other people could undermine my authority. Okay, I would have to get rid of the Bible. That's why most uh, preachers out there in these church buildings, they get rid of the Bible as the final authority because then their people out there can't question them. They can kind of run things and say, well, I, I feel that that's what we want to do here and stuff like this. They're the ones running cults. Uh, Bible-believing Christian like myself, I'm not running a cult. I'm giving people the same authority that I have. I'm not trying to lord over them. I'm saying, hey, right here's your authority, not me. Okay, so you say, well, um, you know, modern-day science has proved that uh, hermaphrodite births are, are very common and things like this. Uh, well, I would have to disagree with that. I know that they, you know, I looked up a little bit of information on this the one time, and... Um, and, you know, it's, I don't believe it's a common thing. I'll show you here. What does the Bible say about this thing of both male and female? You know, because, again, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I have to go with what the Scriptures say. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let's go the whole way back to the beginning. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish uh, of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, 
In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Does it say anything about hermaphrodite? No. There does, there's a distinction between male and female. All right? But what happens over in Genesis chapter 6? Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. And his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare, bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Um, and you read through the Bible, there's actually, uh, there are giants that have six fingers and six toes on each of their, you know, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Uh, there are genetic deformities that are created because of um, messing around. And in context here, the sons of God were actually angels. You read about that throughout out the Old Testament. Go to the book of Job. You'll see the sons of God are there in heaven presenting themselves before God. And uh, Satan's among them. So uh, when these angels started to breed with women, it created very weird offspring. That's where a lot of the legends come from, uh, the Minotaur, the Hercules, and things like this. Uh, that's why the Lord also prohibited uh, sexual relations between people and animals. Bestiality. Uh, that's also a prohibition of the Lord. But is this stuff going to come back? So you have there Genesis chapter 6, the days of Noah. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, or Noe, if you want to say it, the, see it's coming from Greek to English, Old Testament, it's Hebrew to English, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. All right, so in other words, in the end times, it's going to go back to the way things were happening before the flood. And I believe that a lot of the genetic uh, the you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Deformities, things like that. A lot of the genetic problems that are out there could be the result of um, weird um, sexual practices. And you say, well, are there any kind of uh, sexless beings or whatever else? You know, hermaphrodite type of beings. Well, I can give you. Just trying to think. I think that there is one reference. Let me find it here very quickly. Um, Revelation chapter 9, verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And it goes on, and they have tails like scorpions and everything else. Very, very weird creatures. You say, well, that's probably a reference to helicopters with stinger missiles or something. No, I don't believe that. I believe it's strange creatures. Why? Well, because they were messing around with strange flesh back there in Genesis chapter 6, in the days of Noah. And it's going to be that way before Jesus Christ comes back. So I would say that the hermaphrodite thing, uh, it could come from a number of things. It might be genetic stuff, weird things going on. I mean... Honestly, just seriously, scientifically speaking here for a minute, okay? Just don't even think about the Bible. If there was some kind of a supernatural being from another planet, we'll say, uh, intelligent life from some other planet, like Star Wars or Star Trek or something depicts, and they came to Earth, do you mean to tell me that there aren't women out there that would not line up to have sexual relations with that other being. I mean, you know, I'm just speaking, you know, from a logical standpoint here. Uh, there are, you know, I mean, are there any types of people on this earth that the average woman would say, no, I'm not ever going to have sexual relations with that type of a man over there or something like that? No, no. And you get people in that are truly sexually perverted 
they're looking for different ways to get off, speaking bluntly. Um, so if an angel showed up, uh, there would be women that would want to breed with that angel. Now, is that what's causing the hermaphrodite thing? I can't say that 100% of the time. There could also be hormones that are, that are being taken, um, uh, different types of um, prenatal vitamins and things like this. Some of that stuff gets synthetic. That can get kind of iffy. Um, what's the uh, the thing that they do where they 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 artificially create a baby? What is that called? IVF, in vitro fertilization. In vitro fertilization. You know, there could be some things there. They're messing with DNA and stuff like this, and they've been talking about this thing. I can't think of what it's called, but it's this new science that they're coming out with of of changing DNA molecules to make designer babies. I mean, the scientific community is working on this, so this is not my conspiracy weird theories or anything else. And, you know, don't tell me that they're just just now discovering it. I think that they've been messing with this stuff for a, a long time now. There could be some fertility drug stuff there, women that can't get with child to be with child for a long time, and so they start to take fertility drugs. A lot of these drugs, well, all of the pharmaceutical drugs are based on petrochemical poisons. Uh, what is that going to do genetically? Um, so, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I have to cover this before I answer the question, and that is, I don't believe that God creates, uh, if you have a healthy father and a healthy mother of, of, you know, the same kindred there, whether you're not going to have genetic issues, um, when you have the two of them come together, I think that there is absolutely no chance at all of them creating a hermaphrodite. I don't believe that. Um, I would have to see some kind of actual scientific proof of that thing happening and that there's no occultism, there's no drugs being taken, there's no whatever, their healthy lifestyle and a hermaphrodite is created as a result. I don't believe that such things happen, quite frankly. I don't see it in my Bible. So again, as a Bible-believing preacher, I am bound to the book, okay? Um, if I didn't have a standard out there, then I could change my positions frequently and get away from people proving me to be false or something like this. I mean, if people want to attack me, it's going to have to be through the Bible. That's my standard. Uh, could could somebody like that preach or teach? Um, no. I would say no to that. Uh, if somebody, you know, through no fault of their own, say a, a young man is born this way or something like that, um, Again, I mean, we're, we're getting into the realm here of what-ifs, and uh, I don't really see any proof that would convince me that it's even legitimate, okay? Um, I just don't see it, that, uh, that people legitimately are being born hermaphrodite that aren't messing with drugs, that aren't messing with um, weird spiritual types of things or fallen angelic type of whatever. I mean, it's... So, um, that's how I would answer that. Um, I would say that somebody, too, that is a hermaphrodite is probably going to be pretty mixed up in the head. So, I just don't see, I mean, show me from the King James Bible that somebody was both sexes. And, of course, you know, another thing I have to address here is they'll say, well, there are some things in nature that are hermaphrodite. No, there's nothing in nature that's hermaphrodite. It's asexual. Okay, there are trees, there are some bugs and things, I believe, that are, that are asexual. That doesn't mean that they're hermaphrodite. All right, that, that is a created term. So I don't believe that God created any people. You know, I mean, the Bible says male and female created he them. Uh, there's no crossover. So when this happens to people, unfortunately, it's because of the sins of the parents, uh, whether taking drugs or messing around with strange flesh or whatever else. That's how I answer that question. Uh, Chief Joe Boo, do any certain people in Scripture relate to us or set an example for us? Paul. Um, uh, let's see if... Looking for the verse that says, Be followers of me. Oops.
Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Um, Philippians 3, 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. So, uh, not just following Paul, following the Lord Jesus, and also uh, other men that have come after that, that uh, have lived a godly life and, and lived by example, you can follow them as well. Continuing here. Denny Campos, is there a method to how you study the Bible, i.e. Bible study materials? Well, sword searcher, I'll do that. That's a good way to study the Bible. You can think, what was that one verse? And you remember part of it. You know, it's a kind of a quick way to find it. Um, you can use a Strong's Concordance. I don't mess with the Greek or the Hebrew in the back. I don't waste time on Greek and Hebrew. Um, God used 54 of the greatest translators, scholars out there for seven years to make this King James Bible. So I'm not going to be better. I'm not going to do a better job than they did. Um, I don't mess with Greek or Hebrew. Um, I don't have any kind of a written plan of start out with this verse and go to that verse and then, you know, I'll just pretty much do what the Lord tells me to do on that. Um, just read it that way. That would be my answer. Um, J. Henning Kelogia. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 7. The thousand years is before or after the return of Jesus. In verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth. Who are they? Thanks. Okay. Um, thousand years is after Jesus returns to the earth. You read about that in Revelation chapter 19. Jesus comes down and verse 4 of Revelation 20 says, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Um, Revelation chapter 20 verse 7 And it says here, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go up and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they, who's the they? The nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. That's the they. They went out up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So at the end of the millennial kingdom, after population has grown back again, um, Satan is going to go out and deceive them, the people, the different nations and things like that. Okay. Um, Deborah Gill, brother, my husband is unsaved and wants me to have a job outside the home. Is it allowed to disobey him and quit? He is disabled and cannot work, and I don't want to stress him out, but the workplace is so evil. Any suggestions? Well, the Bible says that a woman is to be a keeper at home. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that a, a wife that is married to an unsaved husband is not bound to her husband. Um, you know, we it is very possible to make some very bad decisions and get yourself into a bad place as a Christian. And I would say that that's in a, in a, being in a bad place there. Um, you're going to have to pray about that. Um, I personally think a woman should be a keeper at home. And uh, being married to a lost man, there's not that spiritual headship there. So uh, I would definitely pray about that. Honey Pie, who do you believe the 24 elders are? If you believe they are the church, then why was the number 24 used? Well, they have to be saved Christians. I mean, obviously, from what you're saying here, you, you have it figured out at least that it has to be a multiple of 12. Okay. Or, you know, 12 is, is there. Two 12s is 24. Um, it'd be no sense to have you know, three eights or something like that, or or four sixes or something, four groups of six people. doesn't make much sense. So instantly most people think when they see 24 elders, they think 12 apostles and um, I forget what the other one is, the, the 12 sons of Jacob. They'll do that. That's the 12 and the 12. There's a big problem with that. Let's look at the passage here. Revelation chapter 
5, um, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts and tw four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Okay, the twelve sons of Jacob... Uh, we're not given those promises. And if you have the 12 sons of Jacob plus the 12 Jewish apostles, uh, they're not uh, from every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. So it can't be the 12 apostles and the 12 sons of Jacob. can't be. Um, I'll show you who I think it is if you want my honest opinion on the thing. I think of where the Scripture's at here now. Uh, let me think here. I have to look it up. I'm trying to find it there, and I just can't think of it right now. I'll find it here in a minute. Okay. All right. Keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 5 and go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. All right. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. Um, it says here When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So the bounds of the people is set according to the number of the children of Israel. How many is the number of the children of Israel? Jacob, in other words. Jacob and Israel are synonymous. Twelve. So there are twelve boundaries according to this verse here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Now you take that. And you say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, yeah, but you go back to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts 17, verse 26 says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. So those bounds are still there. God still recognizes the boundaries. Twelve boundaries. Now, think about this. He has set the, or uh, determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. What does Revelation 5, verse 9 say? Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation? The 24 elders are from that? Well, if I was to hazard a guess, then I would say there are twelve natural boundaries that God has set up, that he determines that there. Um, and if you took two people from each of those 12 boundaries, you would have 24. You know, thereby representing all the different kindreds of people, all the different ethnicities, nationalities there. So it's be kind of like the Lord's, sort of like a very interesting trophy room for the Lord where, you know, not trophy room, but very interesting uh, trophies for the Lord where he says, okay, there's two over there that are 
Oriental. There's two over there that are, you know, white European. There's two over there that are African. There's, you know, two from each of those 12 boundaries. I mean, that's really the only thing that makes sense to me. Um, could the Lord just arbitrarily pick 24 Christians and just say, okay, you're the 24 elders? Sure, but they can't all be Jews. All right, they can't all... 24 elders cannot all be Jews because Revelation chapter 5 verse 9 says that they're from every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So it would make sense to me that how the Lord separates the different nations, the different bounds there, um, that he would take that and make that into the 24 elders. That's what I believe on that. Next we have S. Lewis. Would you please address the growing delusion that Mandela effect is changing scripture? Well, you know, again, um, I just look at the thing and I say, you know, all you really need is the Bible for that thing. Uh, I mean, you know, you probably look into it more, and I don't know if I'll ever do that or whatever, but, you know, the point is, you know, the Bible says very plainly in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, I've talked about this in the past, Matthew, chapter 24, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Um, you don't have to worry about anybody changing the word of God or whatever else. It's ridiculous. So just rely on Scripture. God's word says it's not going to change. Um, it's settled in heaven. Don't worry about it. Fiona Wright says, Have you heard of the teachings of Robert Henderson and the courts of heaven? No, I haven't. He has stated in an interview with Sid Roth that God inspired him with this doctrine and told him to repent of his son's sins. His son was then healed from depression. I have not found anything on YouTube that has exposed his teachings, and yet it has reached us here in the UK. Thank you, Fiona. Um, no, I've never heard of the thing of, of asking God to forgive your son's sins, or you... How was that again? Told him to repent of his son's sins. Well, whenever somebody says, God told me to do something, you say, okay, um, what chapter and verse can I find that in? What you're saying there. I mean, I say, God showed me such and such, but then I'll quote scripture to line it up with what the Lord showed me. Okay, it's fine for somebody to say, God told me this or God showed me that, but it has to line up with scripture. So I would have to ask this guy, where in the Pauline epistles is anybody ever told to repent of their, you know, repent for their son's sins, and then they get cured from, uh, healed from depression. Uh, no, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, sounds interesting. It'd be nice if somebody could look into that. I mean, I got other projects to do. So, but I'd, you know, always go back to the King James Bible. What does the Bible say? Uh, Brian Goodman. How for sure do we know when God started and the seventh day is on a Friday night to Saturday, he might be might have started, or is it how Jesus said, Never judge a man for that for what day he holds holy and pray I not come back on the Sabbath and I understand still many more to be saved, that will be a bad day. Uh I don't really know what you're saying, to be very honest with you. Uh, I know that there are some people that write questions that English is not their first language. Maybe that's the case here or whatever, but I really have no idea what you're saying. Um, sorry, I'm confused on that one. Uh, JT Does says, I'm stuck in one of the largest high schools in Indiana, so what are the best ways to witness to students, teachers, staff? Also, how to avoid being forced to do things that are against my beliefs as a Christian, i.e., I have to do a whole day of a Woodstock convention to pass U.S. history, I'd much rather take the F. Your videos have been a blessing to me. Thanks very much. Well, do you have something to say on that? Um, well, there's two options. You can take the F and say, I don't care what the school says. I'm not going to take the class at all. Or you can take your King James Bible and sit in an inconspicuous place so you're not bombarded with the front row you know, sound effects, boom, 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 from the convention. And uh, you can, you know, 
do your best to tune out the, the wickedness by sitting, you know, in a back seat that's inconspicuous so they can't see what you're doing mm -hmm. and read your Bible and, you know, do your best to tune it out so that way by the time the event is over, you can, you know, just start yelling out scripture from the Bible, you know, because that's a way of rebelling against the system. You can't really rebel against the system in a front row seat. Yeah. You know, and, and it, take along uh, tracks and, you know, uh, covertly, if you get the chance, the Lord open up an opportunity to witness during the thing. If his parents, his or her parents are saying, you have to go, you have to go. Okay, mm -hmm. take, a, take along enough tracks, you know, that relate to the event and say, uh, you know, just start witnessing covertly. Yeah. If, yeah, if, I'd, no if you're if you're hearing that, I'm gonna try to get the volume turned up on that because my wife is sitting over here working at her desk, and um, just the thing of being in a public school and things, um, you know, it's it's funny because the the standards that public schools take is tolerance and diversity, and yet they won't tolerate you reading the Bible or witnessing and things like that. Which um, honestly, uh, I think that the best safest place to be as a Christian is on the front lines of the battle. Um, you know, let the Lord protect you, and I would just simply bring in your Bible, King James Bible, and just sit there and read it, no matter what they're doing. Uh, maybe get some earplugs or something, stick it in, and in your ears and things. Um, just be open to what the Lord wants you to do in that situation. Uh, as far as witnessing to students, teachers, and staff, that's the best way to witness um, by just simply rebelling against the system and saying, you know, hey, if I came in here and said I wanted to rebel against the system by um, dressing up like a girl or something like that, you know, I don't know, well, you're not really saying there, uh, girl or, or boy, I'm not sure, but, you know, if, if you were just, like, saying you wanted to dress like the opposite sex or something, well, they'd be like, oh, we're for that, you know, but you coming in and just simply, you know, carrying a King James Bible in and sitting down with it and saying, hey, I want to read this while this thing's going on, whatever else, well, you and can't do that, you can't do that, oh, yes, I can. I have a right to do that. And if security, if there's security at this event, and they give him a bad time about carrying, you know, a bag with him, him or her, or security gives him or her a bad, bad problem about carrying the Bible, <clears throat> just simply say, "Are you, are you discriminating against me because yeah, of my use, religion?" Yeah, use their own language against them. Say, "Are you are, intolerant are, of diversity?" Right, right. Are you discriminating against my, my religious beliefs? Are you intolerant of me? Blah, blah blah. You know, use their own terms against them is right. what I would do. Um, that's the best thing to do. Uh, I was going to say something else there. I forget what else else I was going to say, but um, I think your best bet is just to you know, just to uh, just read your Bible at that in that time. There is what I would do. Okay, Romans 10.17 says, What are your thoughts on Lester Roloff and Martin Lloyd-Jones? The reason why I ask this is because these earlier 20th century evangelists were more or less this country's and world's Jones was from the UK, last ray of hope. Sadly, after they passed away in the 80s, that's when they, these easy believism heretics really started to infiltrate and attack others that just merely preach holiness and living by the Bible, i.e. prior apostate Christians all but left Roloff Jones and Oliver Green alone. Um, just to clarify, I wasn't trying to say you're lukewarm or bad or anything. I've been edified by your ministry. The point I was trying to make was that back then, lukewarm Christians left Christian ministers alone. Um, Roloff Jones and Green pulled no punches. But now, if anyone just preaches mere holiness, they'll get attacked um, like they're some works-based salvation heretic. Well, actually, you're wrong about that. Um, if you look into it, um, a lot of those guys were actually um, being wooed in by the false prophets and uh, the false prophets were being buddy-buddy. They weren't leaving them alone. I do agree that they, those guys were preaching you know, the right gospel. I mean, you listen to some of Lester Olaf stuff. You talk about saying repent of sin. I mean, that, the guy was rough on the thing of sin. I remember I have a recording of him and he's like, you know, invitation time comes and stuff, and he's at this revival meeting or something where he's at, and he's like, he's like, I just want to say, you know, if if you don't intend to live for Christ, you know, then basically don't come forward. 
I don't want you to lead, to lead you in a spurious or false profession of faith. I mean, He's got to be the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings of your life. And if you don't intend to live for Christ, then don't pray to get saved. I mean, He, he just, bam. So I know what you're saying. But if you look into it, Jack Hiles was trying to be buddy-buddy with Lester Roloff. Now, I'm not sure about this uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever heard of him. Oliver Green, yeah, I've heard of him. But, uh, you know, Jack Hiles was starting to really, he was trying to be buddy-buddy with Lester Roloff. And Jack Hiles is the originator of the whole easy believism, satanic heresy. So they weren't leaving those guys alone. They were trying to get their arms around them and trying to draw them into their system. That's the only thing I'm disagreeing with you, with you on there. But, uh, you know, the... You know, my thoughts on it are basically that, uh, you know, there definitely was a change that happened years ago, and um, but I think it was pretty much inevitable. I mean, I think if uh, those guys would have lived longer, um, they would have just been attacked just like, you know, myself or anybody else that sticks to preaching biblical repentance to salvation. And... Uh, but, you know, it's just it's interesting to see that uh, Lester Roloff did associate himself with Jack Hiles. And I believe Jack Hiles, being the snake that he was, probably was, oh, yes, Brother Roloff, I agree with you, I agree with you. And then behind his back, you know, he's preaching Lordship Salvation and all this stuff. Lester Roloff uh, was a good man from everything I've seen. I've enjoyed a lot of his preaching and things I, I don't, you know, he was wrong in what he did, yoking up with uh, the Babel building movement thing, and that's what the 501c3 deal was all about. That's why they went after his homes, because the homes were parachurch ministry to the church building, 501c3. So when Lester Roloff's going, you're not going to come in and tell us what we're going to teach these young people, um, then it was like, well, yes, we are, because you're 501c3. So it, that's one of the dis disagreements I'd have with Lester Roloff, but as far as the salvation gospel that he preached, he was right on the money. And uh, But the, those guys would have eventually infiltrated the system. They were already working on him when he was alive. So, on to the next one. T.N. Gallon the Garden. Hi, Brother Brian. What is your opinion of the late Dr. Adrian Rogers? I do listen to his teachings. I have learned much from you, and thank you for the time you spend in study and teaching. May God bless you, your family, and your ministry. Thank you. Uh, no idea. I'm not sure who Adrian Rogers is. I don't know if I've ever heard of that name before, to be quite honest with you. So, sorry, I don't know who he is. Next one, Jay Righteous. I have another question regarding the, the rapture. I do believe in a pre-tribulation catching away, and my question is what will happen to our children that are too young to understand or to profess Jesus Christ as their Savior. I have a six-month-old, and I always pray with, uh, I always pray with and for my child, and read scriptures to her. Will she be raptured with the body of Christ? Uh, that's a good question. I do believe that um, children are going to be going up, all children. I've t I believed and taught that now for years and years and years. That both saved and lost children, if they're under the age of accountability whatever that age is, some children will reach it before others, where they can understand, I've sinned against God, I've, I've wronged God. It's not just that I've disobeyed Daddy and Mommy, it's I've sinned against God. That's the age of accountability, when they can reason that out in their minds and they understand personal accountability to their Creator. Um, if they're under that age, then I believe they're going to be leaving at the rapture. That's why it's such a shocking event that's going to happen, and that's going to be the the major catastrophe that the Antichrist is going to come in and the world government will come in after the rapture. That's going to be a very, very major thing. Um, I do have a, a, a rapture, pre-trib rapture moment on that particular subject of what will, what will happen to the children after or at the rapture or whatever, I think. But um, I definitely believe that a child is going to be going up at the rapture, um, you know. I mean, those thoughts will come into your mind when you're a parent, you know. I mean, I used to be a single guy for years and years and years early on in the ministry. And it was just like, even so, come Lord Jesus, let's get out of here, you know. And, and I was so ready for the rapture because it was just like, I know I'm saved, I know I'm going up. And 
you know. Um, then I got married, and it's like, well, my wife, you know, she's saved. I know we're both going to go up and things, and so praise the Lord. And then, you know, the Lord gave us our son, and it's like I look at him sometimes, and I think the thoughts enter your mind, you know, and you think to yourself, what would it be like if he got left behind? You know, and it's just like, oh, man, it scares you. The Lord's not going to do that, okay? Your, your child is innocent, six-month-old little girl. She's not going to be left behind, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, as far as the scriptures on that, I'll show you a good one here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This teaches an uh, important concept with this thing. Um... 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So even if one member, if one, like the wife is saved and the husband's not, or the husband's saved and the wife is not, your children are considered holy before God. Young children that haven't reached the age of accountability. So if you're both saved, then of course your child is that much better off. So uh, the Lord's not going to leave a six-month-old or a child under that age of accountability. He's not going to leave him here for that time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, the time of Jacob's trouble, as the name implies, it's for the nation of Israel. Jacob is Israel. Okay? Uh, another one here, same person, Jay Righteous says, Brother Brian, thank you for all your eight sermons. I have a question regarding Genesis 9.22. Was Noah really a victim of sodomy by his son Ham, as Brother Ruckman suggests? Or did Ham have sexual relations with Noah's wife? What does it mean that he saw the nakedness of his father? Okay, go back to Genesis chapter 9, verse 22. Um, Genesis 9.22. Um... Uh, we'll start at verse 20. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and, was, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the, the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his son, or from his wine, excuse me, and knew what his young younger son had done unto him. Now, Ruckman says that this is sodomy, because he knew he woke up and he knew what his son had done unto him. Okay, um, that's stretching the text, in my opinion. Uh, could that be there? Uh, well, it could be, but it could also be that Noah realized that his son was in there and was laughing at his father's nakedness. Doesn't mean Noah was just totally... You know, um, I mean, it says he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. Does it say he was unconscious? No, it doesn't say that. He could have been laying there just kind of feeling a little bit sick or whatever else. And his son came in and was, and was looking at him and he was just like, well, what is he doing in here? And then he walks out, Ham walks out and tells his two brethren. And the brethren walk in and they take a blanket backwards, put it on their shoulders and lay it over their father looking away so that they don't see him. Um, you know, to imply sodomy there because then God curses Ham's seed. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, it could be there, but it's not a clear teaching of Scripture, so I would not teach that personally. So uh, that would be one issue I'd, I'd have to take with Ruckman and just simply say it. You know, Brother Ruckman, it doesn't come right out and say that. You know, um, that's my opinion is on that. Best Faffy says, Hi, brother. Some years ago you made a series, series about the house church. Now you said many times that you have changed your understanding in some issues, like the one pastor issue. Could you make a new series, especially telling us how you would start in house church today? For example, going in a new place. Always remember you in my prayers. God bless you, your family, and your ministry. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I probably should up, update that. I've been wanting to for a while, this whole thing of how to start a house church based on the King James Bible. I really do need to update that because things have definitely changed. Um, that was back in the, the years when I was still somewhat poisoned in my mind by the whole 
uh, be faithful to a good Baptist church. There are still some good Baptist churches out there and all that stuff. Um, I don't believe that way anymore. Um, and I had the whole, you know, dress shirt and tie on and, and uh, you know, there's some Masonic stuff, you know, going on with the shirt and tie, the origins of the shirt and tie thing. So I should probably redo that. So uh, I, I had that on a list of things to redo. I should try to get back to that again. But thank you for the suggestion. Um, Lady Pauline, what must I do to be saved? Uh, well, um, what you do to be saved is simply... Uh, I'll show you the greatest scripture on that. First Corinthians chapter 15. This is how people in the New Testament got saved. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And it goes into people that saw him then afterwards. Jesus died for your sins. Do you understand that you're a sinner? Have you come to that point in time where you realize, I can't save myself? All right? um, that's called repentance. When your attitude changes towards your sin, it changes towards who you are. And you say, I'm not capable of saving myself. That's the end of your self-righteousness. Well then, if you can't save yourself, how are you going to get to heaven? Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. All right? That's salvation. All right? Now, what happens after salvation is that God will come in and He will change your life. God does not desire for you to live perpetually in the sins that will cause you to have an early death. So, after your salvation, things are going to change in terms of your relationship to God. You're now His child. He will tell you what to do with your life. And there will be a change there. Uh, that is just an understanding from Scripture, you know, that, that your life is going to change. I mean, obviously, if you're grieved or vexed by your sin, you're going to want a way out of it, okay? So, well, we do have a salvation video, a salvation message that goes through all the different Scriptures on our channel. Uh, go to the main channel page, the Husky 394XP channel right here, and I have for new visitors there, Salvation Message. Watch that. That'll take you through all the different scriptures, tell you how to be saved. Okay? Next we have Stanislav Turov. I'm an ESL speaker, and English is not my first language. Uh, okay, I'm not really sure what ESL means. English is a second language where English is studied as a foreign language, just like any foreign language would be to us. Oh, okay. So it's, he's just kind of reiterating that himself there. Right. It's not his first language. Okay. Sometimes it's really hard to read and grasp King James Version Bible, especially Psalms and Proverbs. What would you recommend for people like I? Um, well, uh, the King James Bible is not hard to understand. Okay. It's unfamiliar. All right. Uh, there are of course, there are passages that are hard to understand simply because of a spiritual nature there. Uh, but if you look, I mean, let's just let's turn here just for a minute. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, because you said Proverbs, you brought that up. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Was that hard to understand? No. How about verse 2? To know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding. Is that hard to understand? No. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, and to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. I mean, you can just read down through there. I haven't seen anything archaic or really hard to understand yet. Um, there's an incredible amount of propaganda out there that the King James Bible is hard to understand. It's not. 
The King James Bible is actually on about a sixth grade reading level if you go th put it through scientific testing. Why? Well, because most of the words are single syllable. Okay? A lot of the other versions will actually use more difficult language. Uh, many of the new versions are far more archaic in some of the wording than the King James Bible is. So, um, and again, the King James Bible is a spiritual book. You approach it spiritually, and the Lord will reveal it to you. Oh, boy. And, you know, so don't be deceived and see, I'm seeing all these comments back and forth. Uh, don't be deceived into uh, thinking that a new version is going to make, make things easier to, to understand. It won't. Um, okay, next we have King James. You're using a picture of William Tyndale there. It's not really King James, but uh, King James. Why didn't James White debate Peter Ruckman? Okay, uh, that's a good way to uh, ask it. Okay, um, James White, I believe it was, approached uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman for a debate. And Ruckman sent him his, you know, this is the way we'll do it. Um, I think he said that he was going to have James White come there to his church building, um, his Babel building, on April the 1st, you know, full, April Fool's Day or something like this. And uh, he laid out, you know, you'll get 10 minutes, and I'll get 10 minutes, and then you'll get this, and then I get that, you know, and whatever. And James White, no, and he, and he changed the rules again. And, he, well, okay. Well, and it was just like, after a while, Ruckman was just like, okay, you're wasting my time. Uh, here's the way it's going to be. If you want to come and do that, then you can come whenever you want. And it, it's been, it was left open. But what happened is James White came out, and he's running around cheering. Ruckman won't debate me. Ruckman's afraid to debate me. No, Ruckman didn't want to waste his own time. Okay, I get this thing with people, oh, you know, I want to debate you. I don't have time for debate. Okay, I really don't have time for that. I mean, I'm getting work done through the Lord's help. The Lord shows us incredible information. I'm so anxious to bring it out. I have, you know, work to do around here and things, you know, physical work and, and stuff like this. I don't have time to fly around the country and debate other scholars and debate people and, and oh, let's have a debate and it's it's going to be for four hours or something. Ugh, I don't have time for that. And I understand that that's what, you know, the deal was with Ruckman. He was just like, okay, yeah, we'll debate. But then it was after a while dealing with James White, he was just like, okay, you know, this is ridiculous. I don't have time for this. That's why they didn't debate. All right, Mr. KJV, 1 Peter 3.19 says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Is the spirits in reference to Noah and his family and or people in hell? Thank you, brother, for your help. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19. Um... Begin in verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Uh, and then it goes on into different things there. Now, I believe what happened when Jesus... Uh, died on the cross, he went down into Abraham's bosom where the Old Testament saints had to go, down into the heart of the earth, and they were over on one side, and there was a great chasm between them, and you read about that in, in uh, Luke chapter 6, I believe it is, with the rich man and Lazarus, and then the lost were over in hell. So you had the, the people in hell, you had the people in Abraham's bosom. And uh, those two groups were down there, they were separate. And uh, and the Lord went down and He led captivity captive. He led those people out of there. Again, I you know I, I talked about that in another study. I forget which sermon it was, but got into that whole thing. So, um, what's going on there in First Peter chapter three verse nineteen? Um, you know, it was the people in uh, Old Testament in the Old Testament hell included it both where the saved and the lost both went. And you read about that in, let me make sure my reference is right here, Luke chapter 6, I think it is. 
No, I think I messed that up. Luke 16, <laughs> excuse me. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31 is where you read about the rich man and Lazarus in hell. Um, so that's who he went down there and preached to. Okay. The super Christian says, Do you think the great eagle mentioned in Revelation that the Jews fly on is a real supernatural eagle, or could it be what Peter Ruckman thought an airplane? Uh, yeah, uh, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Okay, okay. Um, all right, I was fly I was thinking about the, some of the new versions will change the, the term angel flying in the midst of heaven saying woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Some of the new versions will change angel to eagle. So I was thinking that that's where you were going, but... Thankfully, no, you're using the King James Bible. Um, what exactly is this? Let me turn this light on here. It's getting kind of dark in here. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth, out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might carry, or cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Faith and works again. But, uh, Interesting, because if you keep your hand there and go over to Matthew chapter 24, um, verse 15, Matthew 24, 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Flight, of course, you know, in context would does not have to mean actually flying. It means just flight as in you're running. You're, get, you're escaping. But could it be a reference to what's going on here in Revelation chapter 12? Uh, verse... 14 I don't know um, I would have to ask the question how on earth do these people get an airplane halfway into the time of Jacob's trouble uh, did they just you know maybe steal the thing or something like that and fly it out there and land it in the desert someplace I have no idea uh, it's, a, it's an interesting theory that uh, maybe that the woman there being Israel um, definitely symbolized so she's symbolizing Israel there in Revelation chapter 12 uh, did they get an airplane somehow and fly out into the wilderness well quite possible um, okay Trevor James Vanderlyn where is part one well just type in answers to your questions Let's see, just go here Answers. I'll try that. Okay, answers to questions, part one of eight. So, it's a rather long study. Eight parts. Uh, well over eight hours. First thing I did there. Answering your questions, part one. So, that's where it's at. A King James Shield. How do you get a job without any social security stuff, medical insurance, public schooling, nonsense, etc. when they dry? That, that's what you need to apply for one. Okay, I don't understand the when they dry thingy, but uh, I guess that's a, when's, when that's, it must be a misspelling or something like that. 
Um, well, you go and you get you form your own job, is what I would say to that. Uh, you know, learn how to do something with your hands. Um, Uh, some comment there I was just looking at, but uh, basically you you just want to um, learn how to do things for yourself. Uh, I'll give you a good example. If you live in kind of a country area, you can sell firewood. Uh, firewood is is not taxable. Most people will pay for it in cash. You can even stipulate that uh, that you know I need to have this paid for in cash. Uh, and uh, you can all you really need is a chainsaw and and learn how to do it and, and things and, and a splitting mall get in really good shape too um, there's other things that you can do like that um, clean people's rain gutters out um, learn how to do some plumbing work uh, you know just stuff like that things that you don't have to have insurance or whatever um, there's ways around it definitely Okay, okay, Son of Thunder says, question, is the gospel of Jesus that we are supposed to be preaching, we're supposed to be preaching mentioned in Acts 10, 42, different than the preaching of the good news of the kingdom in Matthew 24, verse 14? Um, well, the, uh, you know, the, the preaching the gospel of the kingdom is not our gospel. In Matthew chapter 24, it's just it's that's not the gospel that we preach today. So, uh, you know, I would definitely warn against trying to preach that kind of a gospel. Again, First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 defines the gospel that we preach. That's what I would say. Okay, final question. A lot of work. Should we still be trying to keep the Sabbath? No. I'll show you a sermon on that. Just type in Sabbath. The search area there. Sabbath day or Sunday. Did a whole study on that uh, up top right there. Um, no, we don't have to keep the Sabbath day. And there's a whole lot of scriptures to prove that. Okay. Um, the quickest one I can turn you to is Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Romans 13, verse 9. Paul giving the commandments that we're supposed to keep. It says, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. does not mention keeping the Sabbath day. Why? Because the Sabbath day was given as a sign to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people. It's not for the body of Christ. All right. And I did notice at the very top, somehow, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, five people sneaked comments okay now four people snuck their questions in after I unlisted the video somehow I guess you must have had the URL to the thing or something but uh, I'll answer yours quickly too just so nobody gets left out um, Grant Page I have a question Brian do you pay taxes on the money sent to your ministry thereby obeying what Jesus said about rendering unto Caesar meaning the government uh, well Charitable donations are non-taxable. Okay, um, if somebody sends me a, a gift for Christmas time, we'll say, or for my birthday, you know, people get weirded out about Christmas and even birthdays sometimes too. Do I pay taxes on that? No. Okay, so somebody says I'm going to give this gift to your ministry. I'm not 501c3. I'm not going to give you a little receipt saying thank you for contributing to King James Video Ministries. Now write this off on your taxes so you can get some money back, whatever else. No, I don't. I don't. I don't give that to people. We are not a tax uh, under the federal government regulations, whatever. You know, no, no. Just like there are lots of types of non-taxable types of things that you can sell. Um, you know, I 
if I sell DVDs, if I sell things like that, then that's a product that I am making and offering for sale. I am charging a specific price for it. Therefore, I pay taxes on that. Okay, but if somebody sends me a gift, uh, just saying, hey, I'm for your ministry, I'm for what you're doing, uh, that's not taxable. So, you know, I abide by the law. I follow law. I mean, I, uh, years and years and years ago, back when I first started to take donations, I was orig originally saying no to it because I didn't understand how the whole system worked, and I went to a professional accountant. My accountant at the time, her name was Diane Denlinger, not actually a relation of me. Um, I think her husband, Vernon, was like a probably like a third, fourth cousin or something like that, but they lived not too far from where I grew up at a farm there, but uh, she was a professional accountant, and I said, taxable, or um, donations to the ministry. And she said, are you 501c3? I said, no, and she said, okay, you can take donations. They're non-taxable. Somebody sends you a gift, it's a gift. You don't pay taxes on gifts. All right, you don't get the receipts from people when they buy you presents at Christmas time or your birthday or whatever, and you don't get the receipts and say, okay, I'm going to have to pay tax on that, I'll have to pay tax on this. Boy, you spent a lot on that gift for me. I'm going to have to pay a lot of tax. It doesn't work that way. So, again, I'm just following what the law says, All right? Petite keyboardist. I've been my racking my brain on Matthew 8 through 11 and 12. Is this talking about the millennial kingdom? Why would the children of it be cast into outer darkness? Matthew 8, 11 and 12. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What Jesus is prophesying there is that the Gentiles are going to accept him as their Savior. We don't really accept him as our Messiah because we weren't looking for the Messiah. But Gentiles accept Jesus as our as I accepted him as my Savior. So I'm going to be sitting in the in the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is always 100% of the time a reference to the uh, physical kingdom that's coming, the millennial kingdom, millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We're going to rule and reign with Christ what the Bible plainly teaches. The uh, Jews, however, that reject Jesus Christ, a lot of these wicked rabbis today that are Talmudic rabbis and they're, they hate Jesus, they say he's the product of fornication and whatever else, they're going to be cast into outer darkness. They go down to hell. Uh, just being Jewish, you could be the most pure Jewish tribe of Levi, the whole deal, you know, a priest of the tribe of Levi, and if you reject Jesus Christ today, you go to hell. And so that time will come at the judgment of the nations, I think, is when this really gets fulfilled um, because they're not judged on whether or not they're Jewish at the judgment of the nations. Matthew 25, towards the end of the chapter there, it's, you know, they're based, you know, their judgment is based on works at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, whether they visited the poor and, and you know, fed the poor and needy and stuff like this, that's what they're judged on. Um, and you're going to actually have Jews at that point in time that have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah, uh, even though they might not have taken the mark of the beast. Um, if they aren't doing good works, if they have not received Jesus as their Messiah, then they're actually going to see Gentiles going into the Millennial Kingdom as sheep, and they're going to be divided off as goats and they're going to go into outer darkness. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 25. That's what's going on there. Um, Stephen Moore, is marriage a Christian union to be done in front of the church, the people, or should it be a civil union blessed afterward by our Lord? I am thinking that there are many unholy unions made, be, unions be made with churches, the buildings. Your insight is always appreciated. Thanks. Um, again, I have a study on that. I'll show you quick here. I try to do things somewhat low tech simply because, um, you know, it, it saves me time. So putting in all the links and hyperlinks to this and that and all everything else, it takes me hours and hours and hours and it, it keeps me away from other studies. So I try to just make it simple. Just go to the channel, type in marriage, 
right there, top one, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Okay, right here. I get into the what, what constitutes a biblical marriage. And uh, just to answer your question, um, marriage is supposed to be, it isn't just a flesh joining flesh like some people say. That's, that's the consummation of a marriage, but that does not constitute a marriage. Because how do you differentiate between that and just fornication or, or whoremongering? where you're living together for sexual purposes, but you really have no dedication to each other for marriage. Uh, no, a biblical marriage is um, a man, man and a woman coming together with the understanding that we're going to get married, we're going to live together as husband and wife. Uh, spiritual coverture, I believe, is the, the right way to say it. The man becomes the, he takes the spiritual covering away from the father and then he takes it on himself he's now the spiritual covering for the wife and uh, he it's not done secretly someplace just go into the justice of the peace and write out a paper or something uh, no it's actually done um, before God before man uh, you know I think family should be involved with it to a certain extent um, if you have a church congregation you know and you do it in front of them point is there should be witnesses to it and as far as uh, getting the state involved um, I think that that's a total complete abomination state marriage licenses are 100 percent unscriptural not necessary uh, again I've talked about that in other studies um, I'm, I don't have real great professional advice for people on that simply because uh, we just we have no state marriage license we have a marriage coverture and uh, a state marriage license puts you under the secular government's control to just be simple about it um, but you know you get these church buildings and they say you know now by the power invested in, invested in me by the state of you know Pennsylvania I now pronounce you man and wife the power invested in you by the state so yeah it's it's a bad thing but I'd watch the uh, study on uh, marriage divorce and remarriage to get all the scripture on the thing of what is a biblical marriage and finally, we have K. Jackson. This will be the last one. Could you do a study on some of the unscriptural beliefs that the Church of Christ, not universal, teach? The, the uh, Church of Christ denomination, in other words. Um, well, I believe that the, the biggest error that they come up with without going and you know, showing their websites and doing an actual expose and everything, the biggest thing that they come up with where they're in error is Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is what they teach for salvation. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, Acts is a transition book and people did get saved that way at the early part of the book of Acts. But they were still taking the, the you know, gospel to the Jews. There, you know, they were for a while and they, and they were confirming the word with signs following um, by the time Paul shows up they're not being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins it's now faith baptism is simply there is just kind of symbolic of the death burial and resurrection as a new creature in Christ Jesus not necessary for salvation alright uh, I don't say it's a sin for people to be baptized I, Hyper dispensationalists go that way. I don't. I don't say that, um, but I don't believe it's a necessary uh, prerequisite or something for you to get saved. Don't believe that. So you have to take the you know, rightly divide the scriptures. So uh, that is going to be it. Um, I think I'm done. I think I've answered all the different questions. Uh, oh boy, tell you what, wipes me out. Um, but I do, I do like the opportunity to be able to answer your questions because I, I'm, I feel bad sometimes because I don't get to do that. But it does take a long time. Um, you know, last time I had over uh, like 500 comments or something like that that I had to answer, and uh, it, it will wear you out very, very quickly, going from question to question to question. I mean, you're probably going to get tired watching the thing. Um, so, um, please pray for the ministry. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to be doing one of these studies again, 
might be a little while. And uh, I think I'm going to have to make a new rule the next time, and that is um, I'm just going to have to go in through and just simply say uh, nobody responding to anybody else. Um, just people are coming here to ask me questions. It's not that I'm the expert or whatever else, but that's the whole point of the video. You know, people coming to ask me the questions. And so please don't reply back and forth. Um, and not only that, but also one question and one question alone. And I'm just going to have to delete other comments. Well, one more question I thought of. No. Please respect my time. Okay. Uh, I just spent the last, what do we have here? Um, hour and 32. So that's two hours and 32. Four, five, uh, seven. It, it's just about eight hours again. You know, that's a long time. To be answering people's questions and things uh, so you know and again it's not just oh well I just I'll you know a lot of preachers their their idea of preaching is they look up a verse of scripture and go oh, I like that verse and then they'll read that verse and they'll make a whole little illustration based on one verse that's never been my practice here uh, not only do I study the scriptures a lot and I try to bring out relevant you know scripture or, or sermons on subjects from the Bible but we also do a lot of other research and we are extremely extremely busy I mean I just I never thought the ministry was going to get to this level and uh, so for me to be spending eight hours answering questions is a lot of work and it just wears me out and um, and that's fine praise the Lord I'm glad he gave me the strength to get through this thing and I'm glad I was able to answer some of your questions out there but uh, I'm going to change the rules if I do this again. I'm not going to be doing, oh, just one more question. No, that's not respectful. And if you're answering people back and forth replies and stuff like that, I'm going to delete them. Okay, you can, you can do that all you want in the other videos, but, you know, it just... So, that's going to be it. I'm not going to say anything more. Just got to get, get this thing done, get it. And now I got to edit and render it too, by the way. So I got to go through and edit everything and stuff like that. So it's it's a lot of work. So, but please uh, do pray for the ministry. Thank you to all those who posed very good questions. Um, that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.